And first up, Osteo DX. Hi, I'm Gary Wakeford, Chief Executive Officer of Osteo DX Incorporated, and we're going to go on a journey together today to understand a little bit more about the cortical bone mechanics technology developed at The Ohio University in Athens. Do you realize that mankind is quickly approaching a time in our evolution when never again will every human being be on the planet Earth at the same time? With the International Space Station and with the progress that has been made in reaching Mars, it is very likely that there will always be a certain number of humans in space. It is also very likely that this number will only continue to increase over time. Did you also know that NASA has already shown that every single person that goes to space experiences bone loss? The longer a person is in space, the greater the magnitude of loss in bone density. This is not only the potential to adversely impact the amount of time they can spend on a mission, but it also holds the potential to predispose them to the early onset of osteoporosis and other bone-based deficiencies. This is a dilemma that will need to be effectively addressed if man is ever to spend significant amounts of time in space. The problems caused by osteoporosis, osteopenia, and other bone diseases is also a huge problem today on planet Earth. Just in the U.S. alone, there are 2.3 million fragility fractures of bone that is currently costing the U.S. healthcare system $19 billion. Yes, that is billion with a B. A fragility fracture is defined as a fracture that results from mechanical forces that would not ordinarily result in fracture. This basically means that the bone should not have fractured, but it did due to the presence of a weakened bone state. This is a simple equation to understand. As people age, there is a higher incidence of osteoporosis. More osteoporosis means more fractures. This malady is not unique to the United States. According to the International Osteoporosis Foundation, globally there are 9 million fragility fractures each year at a cost of $75 billion. This problem is further compounded by the fact that the current standard of care, which is dual X-ray absorptiometry, or DEXA, which measures bone mineral density, is a very poor predictor of fracture. Bottom line is that bone mineral density does not equal bone strength. Leading physicians in this space have quoted as saying, the ability of DEXA to accurately predict a patient's fracture risk is less than that of a coin flip. The current rates of both false positives and false negatives exceed 80%. The end result of this is that we have millions of people receiving treatment who probably don't need it and many more millions in need of treatment who don't qualify for it based on their DEXA score. The cortical bone mechanics technology was developed at Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. The company has a strong working relationship with the state support of the university's innovation center, the technology transfer office, and the funding arm of Tech Growth Ohio. So we have a problem that is acknowledged by NASA, it's acknowledged by the U.S. government, and acknowledged by the U.S. healthcare system. So let's talk a little bit about the solution. And that solution is the cortical bone mechanics testing technology coming out of the Ohio University in Athens. It utilizes vibration analysis to measure the cortical bone stiffness of the ulna. And this is important because it does it radiation free, it's non-invasive, it's painless, and it's very easy to administer. Initial proof of concept testing included the use of both artificial ulnas and cadaveric ulnas. When the cortical bone stiffness of the ulna, estimated by the CBMT technology, was compared with the scientific research gold standard of quasi-static mechanical testing, the data all fell along the same identity line with an accuracy determined to have an R squared of 0.999. Further testing utilized quasi-static mechanical testing to demonstrate the correlation between cortical bone stiffness and cortical bone strength. This also provided an R squared of 0.999. This clearly demonstrates that cortical bone stiffness equals cortical bone strength. Now, when reviewing the current methodologies used in the marketplace, DEXA is by far the dominant player in the current standard of care. 
The common Achilles heel of all the modalities used, however, is that to one degree or another, they all rely on bone mineral density measurements to predict fracture risk. Again, all of the science overwhelmingly demonstrates that bone mineral density is simply a poor predictor of fracture risk. We at OsteoDX are confident that we can further refine the data that we measure to accurately identify a patient's risk of fragility fracture. This is the key to being able to intervene and prescribe treatment to heading off and preventing the fractures from ever occurring in the first place. The roadmap to successful commercialization of the CBMT technology follows a very straight and direct path. We will start first with the research use only market. We will then transition to the US clinical market and then we will transition to the global international market. Stage one involves initially selling the CBMT technology as a research use only device into the scientific and research community. Big pharma companies producing and conducting research on drugs designed for the treatment of osteoporosis also provide an avenue for sale as a research use only device. Sales of research use only devices do not require FDA approval to market. We will use this data to secure FDA approval and move into the U.S. clinical market. Step two will involve our entry into the U.S. clinical market as a class two de novo medical device. We have completed an initial pre-submission with the FDA and are in the process of completing a second. The intent of the second pre-submission is to gain clarity on the specific testing the FDA will want to see in our formal application. It is our intent to submit our formal application to the FDA by July of 2022. This will now allow initial sales into the clinical market by late 2022 and early 2023. Stage then will be after securing FDA approval to market the technology in the U.S., we'll work with our regulatory partners to secure required approvals to market the product into Europe and beyond. Our path in supporting this roadmap to, to a successful commercialization includes the following. Number one, through science we will clearly demonstrate the higher accuracy of the data measured by the CBMT technology and also show the clinical value of the information provided. Two, we will complete a phase two SBIR clinical study demonstrating the ability of the technology via a fracture discrimination study. Five sites to begin in September of 2021, SBIR grant start date of June 1st, 2021. In conjunction with working with key opinion leaders in the bone research world, upon receiving FDA approval to market, we will secure a temporary CPT code as the technology is very unique. We also have what we believe are very reasonable sales projections that will align us to be a successful target acquisition by one of the key providers of DEXA. The OsteoDX team has a very strong group of professionals, as is evidenced by the results to date. We have achieved much with little. We started with state and federal grants to validate the technology and did so very successfully. Our results were so impressive that we have been awarded a phase two grant from the National Institutes of Health for $2 million. We have secured follow-on investments of $450,000 with a $1 million target. If you take a look at our team, our board chairman and our CEO have both successfully taken a product from initial conception to FDA approval and have achieved very successful exits. Board advisors with strong successful grant writing experience and nationally recognized experts in bone research are part of our team. We are in the process of completing our seed round of funding where we have targeted a raise of $1 million. Our ask is the following. OsteoDX is looking for additional investors in the $250,000 to $500,000 range, and we are also looking for an introduction to the NASA healthcare team. With a $75,000 average selling price and a 66% margin, this becomes a very attractive opportunity for a lot of people. We are also working on a second generation version of this technology with a much smaller footprint, which will make it more amenable to being placed in primary care physician offices. There has been a significant amount of activity in mergers and acquisitions in this particular space. We are confident we will become an attractive acquisition target. So our final ask of NASA is help us help you. All right, let's go for some questions. Ramona, 
Would you like to start? Yes. Uh, let's see here. Let me, uh, would the testing take place on Earth before the astronauts went into space? And or could your device be used in space? What is the size and scale of it? And I even uh, have Jan questions. Yes, to answer your first question, yes. The testing would take place before on Earth before the astronauts would go into space. We do not believe this is a technology that would go with them. Currently, you're using DEXA to measure bone mineral density before they go into space, and then you measure, again, their bone mineral density when they return. Our validation studies have demonstrated that we have a much higher accuracy um, measurement in terms of measuring what we measure versus DEXA, and we also believe because we measure bone properties, the data is much more valuable and much more meaningful. We also, in addition to showing, demonstrating a higher level of accuracy, we've demonstrated a higher level of sensitivity. So we are able to notate changes in a much smaller time frames. So we've been able to do it in as short as eight to 12 weeks versus a number of years. So you can also use this to track the progress once they're back and once you put them on some type of regimen to restore their bone strength. Well, sometimes they stay for quite an extended period of time. What is prohibiting, uh, in your perception, your ability to take it into space? And have you thought about what you could do to modify that over time, even though the present model may not be appropriate? We have thought about that. I don't have a good answer for you on what that ultimately would look like. Right now, it's a large piece of capital equipment. It's too large. It's too heavy. It's just not something that really is in the realm of reality for you to take to space. Um, the basic technology may be able to be modified, but it, you know, it, that's not something that I can say we have any have had any progress or spent any time on up to this point in time. Okay. Thank you. All right, Greg, do you have a question? Yes, I do. I was going to follow up a little bit on what Ramona's line of uh, questioning. One of the challenges we have potentially about going to Mars is the fact that astronauts will travel for many months at zero G, and then they're supposed to let function well on the Martian surface at one third G. At that point, you know, the, the bone, that's where I would see a potential where some osteoporosis or or weakening in the bones may affect their ability to perform a mission in a partial gravity environment before you go back. So that would be something that would be an interesting test to see if the astronauts would be able to transition back to a one third G environment. I, that would be a I think that'd be a big question that our human research program has, and that might be something that you know, that would be of interest to NASA. Sure. Um, I'll give you a brief answer and then I'll let Dr. Clark uh, chime in as well. I think where we might really provide value there is because we're measuring cortical bone stiffness and there seems to be a very strong co correlation between cortical bone stiffness and cortical bone strength. And I think that we would be able to give you much better information prior to them leaving in terms of an individual's predisposition to uh, experiencing the bone loss and to what level they might experience it. Brian, I'll uh, hand off to you. Sure, yeah, uh, so so Greg, thanks for the question. Um, I, I'm Brian Clark, I'm with Ohio University. I'm a clinical and technical advisor to the company. And I totally agree. It's really the return to gravity that's the concern for NASA, whether it be on the Martian surface or back to earth. Um, and and the, the real question is, how do, how do we go about assessing their readiness for it when bone mineral density is really measuring the chemical property of the bone as opposed to the mechanical properties, which is the mechanical properties is what determines whether a bone, you know, has deformation and it breaks or fractures. And I think that's where our, our, our value proposition is. Thank you. Chandra? Hi there. Um, so I'm wondering if there's any other clinical applications like fractures that this could be applied to in the general medical market. And do you, and how does this cost compare to the current testing? Do you see that as a barrier of entry? 
Uh, cost uh, is not a barrier to entry. Um, you know, we're working, you know, DEX's machines average prices are 90 to $115,000 per unit. Again, these are large pieces of capital equipment. Even prior to any economy, economies of scale, our unit cost right now is $25,000, and that's building them one unit at a time without any economies of scale. So our, certainly our price versus the current standard of care will not at all be an issue. In terms of how this can be applied in the marketplace, um, in addition to just our basic premise of trying to fend off these fragility fractures, this is a huge problem in our female population. Um, postmenopausal women, 50 years and older, 50% of them will have a fragility fracture. It's a huge issue. And I think that we, if we could start doing some type of routine testing earlier on, maybe at 40 or 45, identify the individuals that are of particular risk, I think we could make a significant impact on that. Some other things that we have looked at is there's a disease called b brittle bone disease, um, which just has catastrophic effects. And we've considered the idea of modifying this technology to try to identify much earlier on in a child's life um, if they in fact um, are susceptible or, or do have the brittle bone disease. So I think there's some significant things we could do with this technology, but I think the the great potential home run here is to try to minimize or reduce the number of fractures that are happening right now. So could it be used to identify a general fracture over x-ray? Is It was more my question than that. Than Brian, I mean. would you like to handle that? Yeah, uh, sure. So the, the short answer is no. Mm -hmm. um, what we're trying to do is assess the health of the bone or the skeletal health before someone fractures. Uh, once someone fractures, you're right, an x-ray works just fine. Um, bone mineral density testing is actually not what's even used to identify whether someone has had a fracture. So, so most all of the fracture risk reduction approaches are, are seeking to try and identify someone who's at risk for having a fracture before they have the fracture. Because once you've had the fracture, uh, I mean, that's a really strong suggestion, unless it's a traumatic fracture, that, that the bones are already weak. So the goal is to intervene earlier. All right. Thank you. Alex, you had a question? Yeah. Uh, thanks for the presentation, guys. This is this is really cool technology. So congratulations on your progress so far. Thank I you. have a question just about your uh, your your business traction so far. And you, you know your revenue and customers and what the plan is there. Can you, can you talk a little bit about your traction so far, as well as what your your sales team and your and your sales process is going to look like? Sure. Um, we are still in the, in the final stages of product development. Uh, we are not. Uh, we are pre-revenue at this point in time. Our game plan is to start selling some of these devices into the research community in the first half of 2022. And internally, we have also been doing uh, a number of tests, uh, some internally and some externally, such as uh, we're currently getting ready to do a test at the Ohio State University Bone Lab. And the testing is being done to prepare our initial FDA application, which will be submitted in June of 2022. So the game plan is to start to sell some of these devices in the first half of 2022 as research use only devices, and start to build some key relationships around key opinion leaders and basically you know share the information that we have share the testing share the data that we have to get people to start looking at this and then um, submitting our fda de novo application as a class two device that'll be submitted in june we anticipate having fda approval sometime in the second half of 2022 and then we would be looking to start selling this fairly small initially to um, uh, key opinion leaders and early adopters as we look to really then build uh, into the clinical market. I think that uh, I'm sure as you know, you know, f um, funding a direct sales force on a large basis is a very expensive proposition. Our game plan is to demonstrate, you know, the superiority of the data that we provide as well as the meaningfulness of it, the trans translational nature of the data. And I think our most likely exit would be to have the technology acquired by one of the major 
um, producers of DEXA. Great, thank you. John Dankinich. Uh, no additional question for me. Okay, great. Mark Walker. Uh, yes, uh, Gary Bryan, thank you for uh, your information so far. Uh, my question is focused on uh, the commercialization strategy. Um, you just laid out your plans for stage two to address the US clinical market. Um, I'm looking for how is your team going to scale up uh, production uh, to from going from just a handful of devices to to grow and achieve that that larger volume that's necessary. And maybe if you can in an uh, open source without an NDA in place, just a little bit more on the cost per unit at that phase and uh, some of the other math behind your your projections. Sure. Initially, we will for the sales into the research uh, market. We will continue to build these internally. You know that that that's not a huge scale up process, and, and that's not a real issue there. For entry on a larger scale into the U.S. market, clinical market, we do anticipate utilizing a contract manufacturer um, for for that uh, aspect of it. You know, we're at a at a unit cost of goods sold right now at twenty five thousand dollars, and and again, that that's literally one person ordering all the parts, building the parts, putting it together. You know, I would anticipate our final cost probably being somewhere in the fifteen to twenty five thousand dollar range, and you know, with a list price uh, of a hundred to one hundred and fifteen thousand dollars. There's a lot of room there to work with a contract manufacturer in terms of the margins involved. Thank you. All right, Rich Godwin. Thanks, guys. A great presentation. Um, one question about your getting to FDA approval and the fact that you're working uh, on as a research basis. Uh, how many people do you think you're going to have to test and over what length of time? in order to get to prove your efficacy and accuracy rate. Brian, do you wanna address that? Um, you know, starting first with the testing that we've done so far and, and what you think a follow-up might be, and then, then I'll be happy to chime in as well. Sure, so Rich, the, the, the plan for the initial FDA application is a claim of, you know, accuracy and repeatability. Uh, and the FDA has a pretty clear, um, you know, accuracy has to be done in, uh, cadaveric tissue, because to actually determine whether a bone's going to break with any accuracy, you have to literally break it. Uh, so that, that's sort of basic cadaveric testing. And we've already done that. Uh, we published several papers in bone and some of the high impact sort of bone health journals along those lines. Now we'll have to repeat some of that testing on our final design. Uh, but that's fairly straightforward and that's not a major, you know, it's not a clinical study like I think, um, what we're mostly used to thinking of. The repeatability studies are also pretty well defined because the FDA has given guidance, at least as it relates to DEXAs, for what they want to see for repeatability. Uh, I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it's nothing overwhelming. Your, your question about efficacy is, is a bigger one, and that's really what our phase two SBIR is going towards. And so the initial plan with the phase two SBIR is to do a fracture discrimination study. And I don't remember the total sample size off the top of my head. It's 400. It's around, it's 414 total. One third of that will be people with fractures and two thirds without. Right. So it's a, it's a fracture discrimination study uh, where we'll do the cortical bone mechanics technology testing as well as dual energy x ray absorptiometry with a total of 400 and something odd study participants, of which one third have had a fracture after the age of 55 women postmenopausal, uh, and two thirds have not. So it's a one to two allocation. Uh, and we, we think we've got five sites lined up with that, Indiana University and Indianapolis, University of South Florida and Tampa, and then University of Florida with two sites, one in Gainesville, one in Jacksonville, and then Ohio University here in Athens. And we're optimistic that we can complete all of that testing. It's a single visit study, you know, in the course of 12 to 14, 15 months. Thank you. Um, just a quick follow up to that. Is it possible to test it on cadaver bone? Uh, it is possible to test it on cadaver bone. We, we, we have done a, in fact, a lot of our testing for accuracy and validation has been done on, on cadaver bone. And that's where we actually can, you know, we'll actually do the, our non-invasive measurements stiffness, and then we'll, we'll excise the bone and do quasi-static mechanical testing and actually break it. And that's where we find 
that what we're assessing is very, very, very similar, but you know, 99.9% accuracy of the actual mechanical properties. The problem with actually doing, I think, something to determine like risk of fracture, uh, in my experience, at least most of the places where you procure um, phones from to do these kinds of studies, they don't have a detailed medical history of, of whether or not someone has had a fracture and things of that nature and whether it was a fragility fracture versus a traumatic fracture. So I, I think we definitely need to do some, some more clinical studies, um, which we've got planned, but uh, a lot of our work can absolutely be done with, with cadaveric tissue, as well as even artificial bones. We've done studies with artificial saw bones, uh, which, you know, from a just pragmatic perspective, makes things easy. All right. Thanks, and with that, time is up. Thank you very much, Osteo. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you.